that's mystical, something that's strange, something that's different. I know when I was growing up sometime in the middle of last century, <laughs> when, my, when my mother would go to church and they'd have communion at the end, and she wouldn't go. And so we'd go out and always wondered what was happening in communion when we left? What was so special? What was so secret about communion? Well, either the church got it wrong, or more likely my mother got it wrong. Because she believed she couldn't have communion. Some people call it the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, because she wasn't good enough. It was for the saints, the special ones. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. Communion is a gathering together, boys and girls, men and women, together as a family of God. We are Jesus' brothers and sisters. It is for those who love God who serve Jesus. And when we do have communion together, we are saying exactly what the children's talk said. We are making up to one another. We are saying we are together. We are brothers and sisters. So communion is open to all who love Jesus. When you have communion, you are saying, I love Jesus. Let's have a look what the Bible says about communion from Mark chapter 14, verses 22 to 25. And as they were eating, so you see it was a normal meal, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Taste. This is my body. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them. And they drank all of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So this communion was established by Jesus as a parting gift to his disciples saying whenever you meet together and you do this you do this in remembrance of me what I have done for you by shedding blood and breaking my body so that you can live now this particular thing has been going on since Jesus' death some 2,000 years ago. And we are not only taking it together as brothers and sisters here today, but we are continuing on it as a family across the world. Back in times past, we are part of that glorious family of God. And it's symbolic. When we take it, we're feeding Jesus' body being broken and the blood being shed. And we want everyone to take part where they can. And so it is our, our bread that we have is gluten-free. We would love everybody to take it. Remember when we first did this in this church, and there was a lady came in, a stranger, a visitor. She burst into tears when we said this, and I said, well, what's the matter? She said, I'm gluten intolerant. I've never been able to take communion for many, many, many years. How wonderful that I can do it now. So we try to think of others as we take of this. And the juice is grape juice. It's non-alcoholic, so <coughs> all can take part. So it was on the night that he went to trade, he took the bread and he broke it and said, this is my body which is given for you. And then he took the drink and said, this is my blood which is also shed for you. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you that this is a time when we celebrate what you have done for us and we celebrate it together. 
knowing that we are remembered what you have done for us. Please bless us, Lord, that we may learn to cooperate and get along with each other just as you gave up everything for us that we could be your brothers and sisters. We thank you, Lord, that you died that we could live. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to ask the service to hand out the, the bread and uh, please take and eat as you receive. Then they'll come and hold, hand out the, the drink and please hold your glasses until you've been served.
What makes us different? What marks cause us to be recognisable? Let's look carefully at three, <coughs> pardon me, at three marks of a child of God in chapter 3 and 1 to 10. There are three marks, <coughs> characteristics, there are three very evident qualities of a child of God. And I want you to see them as John paints them this morning. And again, this is very simple. This is very basic, but also important to our understanding of who we are as a church. Three things that mark the child of God. The first one is the bestowal of sonship. That's what I read. And the second one is the hope of sonship. And the third one is the manifestation of sonship. Now we'll explain these as we go, but I will only talk about one this morning, the first one. That is simply to say that he has been made a child of God. Now you notice that in verse 1 where it says, the Father bestows upon us his love to produce a son. And so we see two things about the bestowal of sonship. Number one, it is revealed by God's love. You see it there in the first part of chapter 3, verse 1. The love causes God to bestow upon us the sonship. So the bestowal of sonship is revealed by God's love. Now watch this. The second part of the verse, and it results in the world not knowing us. It is revealed by God's love and results in the world not knowing us. Now again you have that concept to know again. I spoke of this when I last spoke earlier in the year. It's all over the place in the Bible. You say, well, you're just picking out the passage. No, I'm not. We're going to run into it time and time again. And first of all then, this bestowal of sonship that comes upon us that makes us the children of God is revealed by God's love. Notice the first word in verse 1. It is behold. It's paraphrased. He is saying, so, hey everybody, I want you to I have something to say to you. Now tune in. Wake up and get this. I know the first two chapters are really hot stuff, but you haven't heard anything you can get. The old right in the middle of the book, he says, he summons them to, it, to attention and he says, what manner of love the Father bestowed upon us. Now you say, John, what I left there. The old and all of a sudden, what manner of love. Well, you don't get very excited, John. Why don't you say fantastic? Why don't you say unbelievable? Why don't you say stupendous or monumental or classical love? John said, well, I thought about it, doing that, but I discovered that the love of God is indescribably delicious. You can't figure out how to put the adjectives together. They just didn't fit. And so I gave up and said, oh, what manner of love. You see, it, is, it couldn't be described. There's no human word that could even describe the love of God. Now listen, if we could describe the love of God in human terms, it wouldn't be divine. No, it would be human. I don't like it that way. I don't want to know all about the love of God because it's divine love. What manner of love, and there's all kinds of love, all dimensions of love. And we use the reference to everything. And I hear some of not one people, but a lot of people say, yeah, I love my car. And you think about that, that's pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And you say you love your dog. That's more ridiculous. <laughs> you say you love your wife, then you get a little bit closer, have <laughs> to the truth. And the children, all dimension of them, and everyone love relationship that we have as a little bit different dimension, doesn't it? You see, they're all fine quality of love. There's just plain human love. 
Then there's a combination of a kind of human and divine love. And then there's the pure divine love. You say, well, what a combination. Well, maybe that's a poor way to say it. But I think, I think, the favourite missionary biography I ever read and shared this so many times because it makes an impact on my life. I read the story of John Payton. He was a missionary, missionary to the New Evidence. And I read the story and to me, it was the most fantastic illustration of combination of human and divine love I ever read. He was a seminary student in England, Payton was, and he was trying to decide where God wanted him to serve. And really, I think he had his mind apart from reading what he says. But God led him to the mission field, and he began to think about missions. He married a young girl, and of course they were planning their future together, and God called him, and he seemed to understand that God wanted him to go to a place called New Evidence. Now New Evidence was inhabited by a man eating cattle, which was really not something that John had anticipated. And so he said, well, Lord, if that's the way you want me to go, I'll go. So he packed up his little wife, a few months, got in the boat, took all, and the ship let him off 200 yards from shore. He wouldn't go near the place. And they rode into the highway. And what do you do when you arrive at an island full of man-eating cannibals? Nobody has ever been there that hadn't been invited to lunch and never come back. <laughs> and what do you do? You stick up a sign and say, Bible study begins on Saturday. <laughs> now how do you approach that? You don't even know the language. You haven't even contacted the human being on the island. And you're ready, and you're really not to want to contact anybody. It's bad enough just to go up to somebody that's going to be friendly about what you did. Well, in his biography, his brother was writing. His brother recorded that they built a little lean on the beach and they set it up a little housekeeping. Housekeep. They were there a couple of days trying to figure out what to do. And just waiting on the Lord, and all of a sudden, the natives started peering out at them from around, and the natives didn't do anything. They, kind, they just kind of watched them, which is very, very petrifying experience. And that night they would go around their lean, and it was a very, very scary thing. Well, they were there several months, and they never touched him. And his wife gave birth to a little baby. And two weeks later, the wife contracted a tropical disease, and she died. And the next day, the baby died. And he was all alone, he said, I buried the two bodies and slept on them for three nights to keep the native from digging them up and eating them. And he said, I was very lonely. He said, I was lonely beyond loneliness. And he said, I kept saying to God, why? And you know, that would have been the same thing I would have said. I have said, now listen, God, I have a plan. I wouldn't have you arrive there probably, but I would have, but I would have said to God, I graduated from seminary, this is the human in me, you see. My nature is God. I graduated from seminary, and only that God made a pretty good, only God, I made a pretty good grade. And God, you want to know something, something else? I can make it in the ministry. I can make it in the ministry. There is no sense in sending me out there. I can make it in the ministry, but Lord, I know I why I would drop out, send him, they'll lead him up and nobody will ever know the difference. You know, from every human standpoint, you figure, well, 
That's fairly reasonable. Should I blow my old one's education and be somebody's dinner? That doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, the amazing story about John Payton was that he did go and he buried those two bodies and slept with them and waited for the Lord to lead him. And finally that happened just days after that. And Navy was kicked out of his tribe and he came to John and they began to communicate a little other language. And pretty soon John introduced him to God who had a son who had died for him and that baby became a believer. The tribe heard about it and they started after John but now he had somebody to warn him and the rest of his biography is the most fascinating thing he ever read. They hid him all over the place and the Navy could never find him. On the contrary, the Navy kept bringing other natives to Christ. And pretty soon there was a little group there and a little group there and another group and another group. You know how long he stayed in that island? Would you believe? 35 years. And at the end of 35 years, how did you believe him? He said, I came here. I heard the cry of the cannibals. And as I leave, by the ringing of church bells. And he said, I do not know the one single native that has never received Jesus Christ. And that takes an awful lot of love, doesn't it? Much beyond human love to love people like that. And to stay there and pour out your life into that, that's supreme love, isn't it? You see, that's infinitely sacrificial love. And the most, and the must, that must be the combination of human and divine love. But can you grasp this? Even in finitely love, pure love, is the love of God. You see, God loved us so much that He gave His Son that He might bestow upon us the sonship. We might become joint heirs with living with Christ. Oh, the bestowal of sonship comes from the love of God. What a love it is. It's sacrificial love. Greater love is no man than this Jesus said, and a man laid down his life for his friends. That is sacrificial love. Not only was it sacrificial love, but beyond that, it was eternal love. And God said to Jeremiah, I have loved you with an everlasting love. It was not one that would go and die out. Not only that, it was a love beyond understanding. It didn't make sense to love like that. I'll finish in this last verse. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, he says, the love of Christ which passes what? Knowledge. It doesn't make sense to love like that. Not only was it divine and eternal love, and beyond understanding, but it was a pure love. Do you remember the apostle Paul? He says this, who shall separate us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? You know the ringing answer that is? Nothing. And though no, it was a saving love too. You see, God prepared his love toward us, that in while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God so loved the world that he gave his only purpose son that this sort of lives in. Do not pray for that advice. Praise God. Thank you. Father God, we thank you for your not coming to my word. Help us, Lord, to grow in your grace and in your knowledge. Help us to be more like you each day. Help us to love those that are around about us, like John Payton did. Help us to believe in you, Father.